I am a woman of no distinction, of little importance. I am a woman of no reputation, save that which is bad. You whisper as I pass by and cast judgmental glances, though you don't really take the time to look at me or even get to know me. For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known, and otherwise what's the point in doing either one of them in the first place? I want to be known. I want someone to look at my face and not just see two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and two ears, but to see all that I am and could be, all my hopes, loves, and fears. That's too much to hope for, to wish for, or pray for, so I don't, not anymore. Now I keep to myself, and by that I mean the pain, pain that keeps me in my own private jail, the pain that's brought me here at midday to this well. To ask for a drink is no big request, but to ask it of me, a woman unclean, ashamed, used and abused, an outcast, a failure, a disappointment, a sinner. No drink passing from these hands to your lips could ever be refreshing, only condemning, as I'm sure you condemn me now, but you don't. You're a man of no distinction, though of the utmost importance, a man with little reputation, at least so far. You whisper and tell me to my face what all those glances have been about, and you take the time to really look at me, but don't need to get to know me for to be known is to be loved and to be loved is to be known. And you know me, you actually know me, all of me and everything about me, every thought inside and hair on top of my head, every hurt stored up, every hope, every dread, my past and my future, all I am and could be. You tell me everything, you tell me about me. And that which is spoken by another would bring hate and condemnation. Coming from you brings love, grace, mercy, hope, and salvation. I've heard of one to come who would save a wretch like me. And here in my presence, you say I am he. To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And I just met you, but I love you. I don't know you, but I want to get to. Let me run back to town. This is way too much for just me. There are others, brothers, sisters, lovers, haters, the good and the bad, sinners and saints, who should hear what you've told me, who should see what you've shown me, who should taste what you gave me, who should feel how you forgave me. For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And they all need this too. We all do need it for our own. To know me is to love me, and to love me is to know me. I want you to remember those words because you'll understand them a lot better in about 25 minutes. I want to begin uh, with a little quiz. I want to find out how much you know about water. Water plays a role in the story we're looking at tonight, so I want to ha uh, ask you a few questions. So when I ask you the questions, just shout out whatever you want to shout out, whatever you think is the answer. And if you're at the worship cafe, same thing, shout it out. Even though I can't hear you, we'll try to respond that way. So first of all, what's, what's water made of? What's, what, say it again. H2O, all right? Water molecules, very simple. Three atoms, two hydrogen and one oxygen. Although, did you know scientists are still trying to understand how such a simple molecule behaves in such extraordinary ways? They still don't really understand how water does what it does. Secondly, how much of the Earth's surface is covered by water? 70 to 75 percent, some 326 million cubic miles of water. Bonus question, is there more water on the earth or inside the earth? Anybody have a guess? There's now research saying that there could be up to five times as much water deep inside the earth some 400 miles beneath the surface of the earth than in all the oceans of the earth combined. Amazing. Three, how much of the earth's water is drinkable? Not much. Correct. Just three-tenths of one percent is drinkable. Four, what percentage of your body weight is due to water? About 60 percent, a little more than 60 percent. In fact, 70 percent of your brain is water, which might explain, you know, something or another, I don't know. How much water should an adult drink every day? Everybody says eight glasses, there's really no evidence for that, it depends how big you are. Somewhere around a half ounce to one ounce for every pound of body weight. For me, that would be at 180 pounds, about 90 ounces a day minimum. Yikes, that's like three quarters of a gallon. No wonder I got a kidney stone a couple weeks ago. We got six. How much water, I did, no one, how much water does the average American use every day? How much water do you use every day on average? Yes. 80 to 100 gallons. Showers, brush your teeth, toilet flushing, that's the biggest way we use water in our country, flushing toilets. 
Bonus, how much does someone living in Africa use? Five to ten gallons a day. One-tenth of what we use here. Last, how long can you live without water? At max, about seven days. You can live 40 days or so without food, only about seven days without water. Life as we know it is impossible without water. In fact, scientists have never discovered a single living organism of any size, of any complexity, that can exist without water. Water. I think that's why the Bible starts with water. Genesis 1, verse 2, second verse of the Bible. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And that's why water shows up over and over again in the great story of Jesus. Our year-long preaching theme is the story of Jesus. We are currently in a series called Going Public. And so far, we looked at the story of Jesus' conversation at night with a guy named Nicodemus when he said, you must be born again. We looked at Jesus cleansing the temple, throwing out the money changers to establish his holiness and his authority. And today we move on to John chapter 4. Uh, Jesus has called his, his disciples. Uh, others have begun to follow him as well. He's going public. His movement is gathering a little momentum. But Jesus hears that the religious leaders in Jerusalem are getting concerned and might be coming for him. So he decides to leave the region of Judea. <clears throat> Let's dive in. Uh, the story begins with a surprise that actually uh, you probably missed and that we would miss because we're just not that familiar with the culture and the time. John starts, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Now the surprise here, in order to see it, we have to look at a map. There it is. This is ancient Israel, the region of ancient Israel. Look at the lower, in the south, you see the Dead Sea, the large body of water. The Jordan River travels north up to the Sea of Galilee in the north. So Jesus has been in the southern region, Jerusalem, Judea. Uh, he's gotten word that they're, that they're coming for him, that they're concerned, trying to shut down his, his beginnings of his ministry. So he wants to travel north, back up to his home area of Nazareth in Galilee. And there are two ways to go. Uh, John says that Jesus took his disciples through Samaria to get to the north. That's the most direct route. This was going to have been about 65 miles or so. So in your mind, picture um, between here and about Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. That's about the distance we're talking about. It would be about a two and a half day walk. However, many Jews at that time did not take that direct route. They would rather take that route going off to the right. They would go across the Jordan River to the east, up along the Jordan Valley, cross back over to Nazareth, tra traveling twice as far to get to the north. Why? Because they didn't want to walk through Samaria. There had been centuries-long animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews, uh, conflict over racial and religious uh, issues. And so uh, the Jews wanted often to avoid any kind of contact with Samaritans. So they were willing to walk twice as far. But John says Jesus took his disciples on the direct route, ends up at Sychar, right in the heart of Samaria. That's a surprise. And if we see that, we should be asking ourselves, why would he do that? Why would he do that? Verse 6, Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Jacob, uh, Jesus stops at a place called Jacob's well. By the way, that well is still there. You can see it. It's, in the, it's uh, covered by a Greek Orthodox church right now. At once, it was believed to be about 150 feet deep. Uh, John says it's the sixth hour, which would be noon in the Jewish way of marking time. But it's also possible, since John is writing these, this gospel at the end of his life, and he's living in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey, he may have been using the Roman way of referring to time, which would make this about six in the evening. So it's either midday or it's late in the day. Jesus has been walking now at least half the day, maybe even all day. Either way, by the time he arrives at this well in Samaria, John says he's weary. The Greek word John uses here is a word that carries the meaning of taking a physical beating. Today we might say Jesus sat down because he was beat. Just beat. Bone weary, dog tired. You ever been that kind of tired? Sometimes I think we have a kind of Clark Kent Christology. That is a Clark Kent view of Jesus. That is, we sort of think of Jesus as only pretending to be human, that he's wearing a kind of human costume, just waiting for his opportunity to get into the phone booth and then come out as the superhero he's been all the way along. But when we read this story in this simple language, we see that Jesus is real flesh and blood. We see that when the Word became flesh, that flesh... 
got blisters on his feet when he walked on a hot day. That flesh got tired and thirsty. And if you've ever been bone tired after a day at work or thirsty after a day of high school football practice, you know what Jesus felt. And in his humanity, you know that Jesus knows what it feels like to be you. He was weary. The next verse tells us why Jesus walked all day and why he sat down at that well at that time. Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Now, there are several surprises in this one simple sentence. First, it's not a surprise that a woman has come to draw water. For most of the world's history, even now in most developing parts of the world, finding water is a daily ritual of survival, and it's the women, sometimes women and children, who fetch the water every day. Here's a fact. Women in Africa walk an average of 3.7 miles every day to get their water for that day. That's why we're involved as a church in a ministry called Life Water in Uganda. Life Water provides fresh water wells along with sanitation education in regions of the world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where water can bring life to a community. In fact, Pastor Bruce recently visited uh, Uganda with Dave Levan and Justin Aarons, two other guys from FBCG, and Bruce actually learned how to carry water on his head. I wish I could have watched this. So it's not a surprise that the woman is gathering water, but it is a surprise that she's gathering water at midday, at noon, or 6 p.m., whichever way we go. And that's because gathering water is always done in the morning. First thing, crack of dawn or even while it's still dark for two reasons. Water is needed to even begin the day. Even to begin cooking for the day, you have to have water. And it's also much cooler in much of the world early in the morning. So that's a surprise. Secondly, it's a surprise that she's alone. Gathering water is a social affair. The women all walk together for, uh, for protection, uh, to share the burdens. They talk and they share work together and life together. It's a social event. So two things should jump out at us right away. First, it's the wrong time of day. Second, the woman is by herself, and she shouldn't be. Jesus, knowing the culture, would have immediately known Something was wrong with this picture. Jesus said to her, John says, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, if this story was being told to a Jewish, Jewish audience in the first century, when that line is read, when Jesus says, give me a drink, they would have gasped out loud. You didn't do that when I said that because it doesn't sound odd to you. They would have gasped out loud. They might have even begun hissing or whistling or shouting in disgust. Here's why. Jesus was a Jewish man. It would have been very unseemly for him to speak directly to a woman in public who was not his wife. More than that, as a rabbi, and by this time Jesus would have been seen as a rabbi, he had followers. A rabbi was never to speak to any woman in public, not even his sister. There was a rabbinical law of the time that said it's better to burn the law of God, Scripture, than to give it to a woman. In that culture, women were regarded as unworthy of instruction in theology and scripture. Rabbis simply didn't teach women. Now, a side note here is that in every one of his interactions with women in the entire New Testament, Jesus is absolutely revolutionary in how he regards them and treats them. Second, a Jewish man would never, ever, not in a million years, drink water from the same container used by a Samaritan. They were seen as perpetually unclean by uh, virtue of Jewish religious law. It would have been the equivalent, roughly, of getting down to your hands and knees at your house to slurp water from your dog's dish. Unthinkable, gross, nasty. And John tells us even the woman is surprised. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman says to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And in parentheses, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She's understandably shocked and confused by this strange Jewish man who not only speaks to her, not only looks at her, but asks her for a drink. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. 
The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Okay. Jesus breaks all kinds of religious and cultural barriers here. We can kind of see that. He's not supposed to go through Samaria. He does. He's not supposed to talk to a woman. He does. He's especially not supposed to talk to a Samaritan woman, yet he does. He's supposed to see her as spiritually unclean, as unworthy, and yet he asks her for a drink from her container. He initiates a spiritual conversation. He blows right through all the social, cultural, religious barriers. Why? He does all this because he doesn't see a Samaritan woman. He doesn't see a woman unworthy of his presence and attention. He sees, rather, a person created in the image of his Father in heaven. He sees a lonely woman who's dying of thirst. Not physical thirst, but spiritual thirst. A woman thirsty for what only he can provide. Way back in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah writes, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. The world is full of people who are drinking from wells that do not satisfy their thirst, that do not satisfy the longings of their souls. Wells of work or wealth or success, wells of serial relationships, our culture's definition of love. Maybe you were once that way. Maybe you are even now. Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 55. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. What's he talking about? Remember a couple of weeks ago the conversation with Nicodemus? Now Nicodemus was a Pharisee, devoutly religious, the most religious of his day, and yet Jesus says you must be born again, completely transformed by the gift of the Spirit of God. This woman is as far from a Pharisee as you can get. And Jesus offers the same exact gift, the gift of God's grace that transforms her from the inside out. At FBCG, we believe that the gospel transforms people and that transformed people make an impact in the world. Now, what does it mean to be transformed? It means that Jesus changes our understanding of God. Jesus changes our understanding of ourselves. Jesus changes our understanding of salvation. Jesus changes how we see others. Jesus changes how we see the world. Jesus changes the priorities with which we live our lives. He changes us. Jesus takes the most common human experience, the most basic human need, water. And uses it as a powerful illustration of both who he is and what he's come to do. He's come to give living water because he is the living water. He may have had two comparisons in mind when he uses this phrase living water. First might have been the Dead Sea. I pointed it on a map earlier. It's the large body of water in the south of Israel near Jerusalem. And it's dead. If you've ever been there, nothing grows there. Nothing grows in the Dead Sea. There's no animals, no plants, no nothing. It kills everything it touches. It's a weird uh, liquid, all right? Sort of like the dead rituals of religion. Second, you might be thinking about the water from Jacob's well. Good water, drinkable water, yet water had to be fetched over and over again because thirst returns every day, like the ritual sacrifices of religion practiced over and over and over again. He's ending all of that. And at first, the woman misunderstands. She thinks Jesus is offering her a way to avoid having to draw water every day. But he's not talking about H2O. He's talking about himself, about the grace of God, about transformation. He's talking about eternal life. So she doesn't understand, so he presses closer in. He doesn't want to just have a surprising conversation. He's going for transformation. So he presses closer. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. In other words, bring him back. The woman answered, I have no husband, which, of course, was only part of the truth. 
Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Now we see why this woman is fetching water alone. You've had five husbands. The one you have now is not your husband. What would that have meant in that culture? Now, first of all, five marriages didn't necessarily make her a sinner. It's possible in that day and time that she had a legitimate reason to be married five times. Maybe she had been widowed multiple times. That's possible. Maybe she had been discarded multiple times. In that culture, it was very easy for a man to secure a divorce for almost any reason. He had all the power and could just dismiss her and toss her aside. So as a widow or divorcee, she would have had very few options. She could have become a beggar. She could turn herself into a prostitute, or she could become another man's wife. So maybe she had to do that five times over. It's possible. But sharing her bed with a man who is not her husband, that is a sin. But rather than back away from her as a sinner, as unclean, as unapproachable, as one to be avoided, Jesus actually moves closer to her right at that point. Remember, To know me is to love me. To love me is to know me. Jesus loves her because he knows her. He knows her sin. He knows her past. He knows her pain. He knows her loneliness. And because he knows and loves her, he confronts her. But notice, he does so without judgment and without shame. For shame is why she's alone at this well. She was an outcast, seen as a bad girl. She was a tramp. And she preferred walking in the hot sun to get her water alone rather than endure the stares and the comments of the women from her village. The equivalent today might be the survivor of an abusive relationship, recovering addict, a woman trapped in the sex trade industry, a person, man or woman, involved in a sinful behavior that causes us to shake our heads in judgment. Fifteen years or so ago, man called me. I didn't recognize his name. Set up an appointment, came to see me at the East Campus. I'd never seen him before. He walked in, sat down, and took him about 30 minutes to finally fumble around enough to tell me what he'd come to tell me. He looked at me and said, Pastor, I need to tell you something. I'm a gay man. And he said, now that you know that, am I welcome? Can I come to your church? I said, first of all, it's not my church. This church belongs to Jesus. And second of all, Why would you ask? He said, every church I've ever been a part of, when I told the pastor that, they asked me to leave. I said, well, I don't want to to talk to you first about you being a gay man. I want to talk to you first about Jesus. I said, do you know how much Jesus loves you? He began to weep. just began to weep. I said, we can talk about all the other stuff later, but that's the first thing we need to talk about. Question, how often do you see labels instead of people? How often do we see behaviors and appearances instead of hearts that are thirsty? She says, rightly, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. How like us she is. Jesus gets close. He puts his hand on her heart and she changes the subject. I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. She's confused about God. She's confused about worship. She has no idea what God thinks of her. Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor on, in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. Listen, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And by the way, that's why we can worship right here in this room today, and we don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Boom! Do you see it? Boom! There it is. She's confused about God. She has a vague knowledge that Messiah might be coming, a vague hope that when he comes, he'll explain all this. Maybe he can explain the mess of her life. Maybe he can uh, tell her why her life is a series of failures. Maybe he'll be able to bring something good. Maybe. Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. The literal translation is, I am the one who is speaking to you. You see it? 
I am is the ancient name of Yahweh, Jehovah in the Old Testament. I am that I am. This series is called Going Public because Jesus is telling us who he is and what he came to do. He's telling this lonely, outcast, Samaritan woman, a five-time failure in marriage, living now in a sinful relationship who would have assumed she is utterly unworthy, rejected by God. He's telling her, the one you've waited for your whole life, the one you've looked for your whole life, I've come all this way, I walked all day long to come to this well just to have this conversation with you because you matter to me. Do you see it? I've come to give you that which satisfies the thirst of your soul. Verse 27, just then the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? They marveled. Why? Because he was breaking all the rules. He's talking to a woman. He's a rabbi. He's talking to a Samaritan woman. They're shocked, dumbfounded. Now, I do think that by this time they already knew Jesus was a different kind of guy. They knew that he might have been up to something good that they just didn't understand, so they just shut up and they just watched. Verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Here's the last surprise. You see it? The lonely, outcast, discarded woman becomes a witness to the Messiah. The one regarded as insignificant, as unworthy, has become an evangelist, a bearer of the good news. Now, there are three ways into this story. You can enter the story through the character of the woman. Unclean, unloved, unworthy, without hope, looking for love in all the wrong places, Dying of emotional and spiritual thirst. She feels far from God. You can be here tonight and feel exactly that way for your own personal reasons. Jesus says, come to the water. Come to the water. You can enter the story through the disciples. Following Jesus, but maybe still seeing labels like woman or like Samaritan or like sinner. Still seeing categories instead of people. Maybe in some way that's you. And Jesus is challenging you to see. Oh, learn to see people in a different way. And then there's Jesus. Who saw not a label, but a person. Who offered not judgment, but love and grace. Who offered not the dry dust of religion and rules, but the living, bubbling, sparkling water of relationship, transformation. Years ago, and you may remember me telling this story, my family and I spent a weekend at a friend's cottage up in Wisconsin, and before we went on the trip, our friends told us that when we were there, we had to make sure to visit the well, that it had the best water in the whole world. Okay, yeah, we said, we'll go to the well. When we went to the cottage, and on the, uh, the last day we were there, I thought, oh, we need to go to that well because they're going to ask us when we get home if you went to the well because they told us to go to the well. So we found the little instructions, drove out in this country road, found the, all, all the way to the farm uh, where the well was located. And it was just a single pipe coming out of the ground, water gushing out of it just right into the ground. D- just single pipe, water gushing out of the ground like that. And uh, walked up to it, filled up a couple of containers, took a taste, and it was awesome. It was crystal clear, ice cold, really, really good water. And then I noticed to the side a little plaque. And the plaque said something like this. A local farmer dug this well in 1895. He hit an artesian spring, and this well has pumped 40 gallons a minute, 60,000 gallons a day, every day since. It was over 100 years. And it dawned on me as I stood there just looking at that water. For my entire lifetime, and then some. For my parents' entire lifetime, and then some. That pipe had been spewing that clean, perfect, crystal clear water out into the ground. 24-7. All I had to do was receive it in a container. Totally free. Totally awesome. I could have spent my whole life and never seen that well. And never knew it was for free. I think that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I give becomes 
a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Would you bow your heads with me as I close? Lord, how we thank you for your word in this beautiful story of a nameless woman who long ago discovered the living water of your grace. So may we drink deeply from the only well that quenches our deepest thirst. And may we learn to see the people around us not through the lens of race or religion or sex or any other of the human barriers we set up, but through the lens of the gospel, the gospel that transforms. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.